Well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Karen Moriarty, and tonight I am co-presenting with Harry Croner. This is so exciting, and it sort of is, you know, the issue of sleep is a two-part issue. There is a physical issue, and then as many of us are very well aware of, there's a mental issue. And so that's why you have two speakers here tonight. So I'm going to present all the things that can physically kind of stand in your way of a good night's sleep. And then Harry's going to understand what goes on up here that could keep us awake too. So what is insomnia? Its technical definition is a sleep disorder characterized by the inability to sleep or remain asleep for a reasonable period during the night. Right. And I love what Shakespeare says, chief is the, sleep is the chief nourisher in life's feast. Mm -hmm. Very true. Mm -hmm. We cannot be all that we can be without a good night's sleep. We really can't, it really does affect us. We're gonna talk about that. Sleep apnea, on the other hand, is the inability to breathe properly or the limitation of breath or breathing during sleep. So the benefits of a good night's sleep starts with, very importantly, that during sleep, the growth hormone is released. Now we're like all grown up, so what does this do for us? Well, even after we grow to, to adulthood, that continues to make our bones stronger. That's what keeps our muscle mass hearty. It promotes lipolysis, our favorite thing, helps us lose body fat. It increases the protein synthesis and stimulates optimum maintenance of all internal organs. All, every single internal organ has a cycle during the time of night that it cleanses and repairs and heals itself. So depending on when you're not sleeping, you might be losing out on that. It stimulates your immune system, which we all need to be healthy, and supports your pancreas' ability to make insulin. Our poor pancreases make enough insulin in a day as our great, great, great grandparents made in a year. Wow. Works very hard. Yeah, that's how much processed carbohydrates have snuck into the American diet. <clears throat> so what are the costs of insomnia? Well, when they interview people, 34% of them feel that the loss of sleep affects their academic performance, their work quality, or their efficiency. I certainly would say that's true. 38% feel that they cannot participate in leisure activities or athletic performances or exercise programs because they're tired from the chronic sleep loss. 54% of Americans have reported that they've actually driven while they're pretty drowsy at least once in the past year. 28% say it's once a month. Same number have fallen asleep while driving in the past year. A third of the drivers. Wow. That is not good. That's Studies show that six hours or less of sleep triples the likelihood of a car accident. <coughs> Chronic state of physical and mental fatigue affects the quality of your life every single day. And poor sleepers experience minor stressful events, right? The molehill becomes the mountain when we're tired. It's so true. We don't adapt well when we're fatigued. And it can actually dramatically weaken your immune system and increase your risk of cancer. Your immune system is your best friend in avoiding cancer. <coughs> stress of irregular sleep cycles can lead to stress-related disorders. Digestion problems, depression, heart disease, stroke, and high blood pressure are all very much tied into people who don't sleep well. That's why it's part of PTSD. Well, uh, losing sleep changes the level of two hormones, which leads to weight gain. So if you sleep better, you'll be thinner. Mm -hmm. And it interferes with the metabolism and hormone production, causing it to age you and set the stage for type 2 diabetes. Remember, the pancreas needs you to sleep. So this is why this is an issue that's important to address and heal from a much more natural perspective than a medication perspective. And we're gonna talk about that because there's a big difference. So they, believe it or not, there's actually five types of insomnia. Some of us have trouble falling asleep. Some of us really light sleepers, like anything wakes us up, then we can't get back. 
wake up too early in the morning, like a 4 a.m. <coughs> and you don't feel refreshed. <coughs> you feel tired. I have people who tell me they sleep eight hours, eight hours a day, but they're tired when they wake up. So how much sleep do we really need? This is interesting because we live in a country that values people who get three hours of sleep at night and run an empire, you know? <laughs> Truth is, that's not really good for them. Babies need 16 or 18 hours of the day to be sleeping. Um, and this is why colic is such a problem. And colic needs to be addressed. It's an unhappy baby. Um, they are, that's their only way to cry for help. Um, we see a lot of infants with colic in here, and I'll tell you, no one, of all the grateful people for the terrible little back pain and migraines and all that we take away, take away colic, and boy, you've got a whole family in love with you. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, really, it's a very rewarding thing to do. They get a little bit bigger, they still <coughs> need a lot of sleep. You know, some of this age group is still napping for a couple hours, but they need to be in bed early in first grade so they can get that 12 hours. And again, the American culture is robbing them because they get a ton of homework and then they have all these after school activities. And then you're trying to give them supper and spend some time with them before you know it, it's nine o'clock at night. And some of these kids have you know, a schedule where they have to get up at six, six thirty in the morning. Interestingly enough, the lack of sleep is known to contribute to ADD and ADHD. It makes a lot of sense, mm -hmm. right? These babies need their sleep. And teenagers, we know this. If you leave a teenager alone on a weekend, you know, they'll do 14 hours or something. Mm -hmm. Adults, we do need that seven to eight hours. We really, really do. Couldn't imagine. <laughs> a 2009 survey conducted, reported the following findings. That 58, only 58% 58 of us um, had a few good nights sleep in the past month. 66% feel that their sleep needs are not being met. So two-thirds of the American public, this is why this is such a popular workshop, will tell you that they don't sleep well. 64% report a sleep problem at least a few nights a week, and 41%, almost half it's like every night. That's a lot of people not sleeping well. A third lose sleep due to concerns. Listen, to, look at this. Their personal finances and the U.S. economy. I am not kidding you. That's what they... <laughs> Look at this. More than 56 million prescriptions for sleeping pills. 600 million on over-the-counter sleep aids. 600 million. They're not the answer. <clears throat> they give you counterfeit sleep. You, you sort of are an amnesic. You don't remember waking up. You don't remember that you tossed and turned. You, you think you slept well, but you didn't. You absolutely did not. They suppress the most important part of the REM sleep and dreaming, hallmarks of deep restorative healing sleep. All those benefits that you get from sleep do not happen with medicated sleep. Many detrimental and potentially dangerous side effects. As we know, there are some that are extreme. And the over-the-counter sleeping pills that cause Benadryl, Benadryl that, that, excuse me, that contain Benadryl can affect us for 18 hours. So you're basically sedated most of the day. Prescribed pills are also associated with feeling groggy upon awakening. That's one of the <coughs> deterrents to them. Most people don't enjoy them. CPAP machines, not always the answer either. They return when the CPAP stopped or if it's used improperly, so it doesn't actually fix. And a lot of my patients tell me this, they're uncomfortable, I can't sleep with them, they make a lot of noise, and especially if you're a spouse, um, that's a real issue. So what's going on? Well, why are people not sleeping? So this is a very simple formula. Great sleep is the outcome of an, of an interaction between being tired and what we're going to call noise. We're going to talk about that in a minute. So obviously sleepiness is that nice mental and physical state of relaxation that ideally builds some momentum as we approach our bedtime. The noise is any kind of mental, physical, or environmental stipu stimulation that inhabits inhibits or disrupts sleep. So if you're not sleeping, you've got 
one or more of these affecting you. And as I said earlier, Harry's going to handle the first one, and I'm going to talk about the physical or environmental stimulations that might be creating the noise for your lack of sleep. Because I really do find people who really are in that 40-something percent that it's almost every night they don't feel well, it does take all three corners of the triangle to, to make it happen. So basically, here's the equation. If the noise is greater than the level of sleepiness, your quality of sleep is adversely affected. So let's talk about this. So my noise, right, are the unstoppable thoughts. You wake up and you immediately start thinking about stuff that you haven't had a chance to think about all day. Body noise is any kind of pain, discomfort, indigestion. There are certain prescription drugs for completely unrelated things that can actually create difficulty sleeping and they'll typically have that on the side effects list. Caffeine, and a less than ideal airway function. Environmental noise are noises are noises in your bedroom, your house, a snoring partner, music lights or a bedroom that's too warm. And we're going to talk about some of the classics that really goes on a lot. So you want to establish, we're going to talk about the environment, you want to establish a bedtime routine that looks something like this. So first of all, to get your body as comfortable as possible. This is interesting and you can actually test this. Sugar keeps us awake. So we all have been taught this, that if you eat a candy bar, you get a little bit of surge, and then when the insulin comes down, pushes the sugar into the cells, you have that crash, right? If you did a candy bar after lunch, you'd have that crash at like three in the afternoon. Well, the same thing happens if you eat any carbohydrates at night with your dinner. At first you feel okay, the insulin comes out, sugar is pushed into the cells, and your body goes, where's the sugar? So typically, these are people who wake up at like one or two in the morning. And how you test this is put like four ounces of orange juice next to your bed. When you wake up, chug the orange juice. If you go right back to sleep, this is your problem. You'd be shocked at how many people that happens to. Orange juice doesn't wake you? No, because what you're doing, much like the diabetic, who when they're in trouble, right, orange juice is a real fast sugar producer. Oh, okay. So you're going to, you don't want to get this into a habit. What you want to do is learn from that experience. If you chug the orange juice and you go right back to sleep because now your body's got the sugar, the sugar craving is taken care of, you need to not go near rice, pasta, bread, dessert, <coughs> you know, all that after dinner stuff has to cease and desist. That's your body giving you a huge clue. Um, you know, we do a purification program. And when you do the purification program, we do it three times a year as a practice, you have no carbohydrates of any kind in your diet for 21 days. And people will tell me, I haven't slept like this in 20 years. Just by taking out all the garbage, all the chemicals, all the colorings. You know, you, everything you eat has to be whole food organic. It's mostly vegetables. You can eat a little protein. <clears throat> but makes a huge difference in everybody's sleep when they do that. But that's the test. Dairy and wheat. A lot of people are sensitive to these foods. You don't know it. It's not outright. It's not, you know, dramatic. But again, these are things to get rid of at night. Obviously, you want to limit the liquids. This is an interesting thing. So to make up for the goodie you can't eat, you know, have a high-protein snack. So you want... Like if you do a protein bar, you just got to look at the carbohydrate content and make sure that it's almost zero. It's zero glycemic index is what you want to look for. You know, standard process makes a great protein shake. And again, you can have that before you go to bed. It's absolutely delicious if you're hungry instead of a sugar-based snack. Caffeine after lunch is a no-no. And alcohol. You know, a lot of people unfortunately think alcohol helps them. Well, it does, but then it stops you from falling into... Um, the deeper stages of, of sleep. And if you wake up, it's hard to get back to sleep. And of course, reduce or avoid as many drugs in po as possible because a lot of them affect sleep. And I'm here to tell you, 31 years, very few medications can't be replaced by something really good for you. Chiropractic care, this is interesting. You know, the colicky babies are babies who ha are in a state of fight or flight. ADD, ADHD kids are kids that are in a sort of state of fight or flight, right? They can't settle down. They can't be calm. 
So it's very obvious when you work on them that they're in what we call a sympathetic state. The parasympathetic state in the nervous system is the state of relaxation. That's the state that gets you from that nice, I am focused, I am calm, to I am sleepy, to I am totally asleep. That's the parasympathetic state. It is the ideal state to be in. This is why people who meditate are so much healthier than people who don't. Because part of things that happens to them is they go into that nice parasympathetic state. Everything I do in this office is to create a parasympathetic state. So we, it's, it looks a certain way and we leave you on those tables and we play that kind of music we play and we have aromatherapy that's designed to encourage that. Because I know most of you are living your life in fight or flight. Most of you are in a rush, trying to get more done in a day than you can, and that's how we live our lives. So we're constantly ramping up the nervous system into a state of fight or flight. Now, fight or flight was based on imminent physical danger. A bear chasing you, a tiger chasing you. Was that the good time to sleep? No. That was a good time to be hypervigilant. That's what waking up in the middle of the night and not going back to sleep is. You've basically done the modern version of hypervigilance. So, one of the ways babies, the kids, become calmer, it's just so much more obvious in them than in adults, is to get chiropractic care. And we can, and when we analyze your spine, we're going to look and see, are the areas that control the parasympathetic state in a state of health, or do they need an alignment so that they can express themselves in a more balanced way in your body? So a lot of people, because that's one of the questions we ask on your intake, is about your sleep. Even if you come in with, for back pain or headaches or whatever you come in with, one of the things we ask you about your health is how are you sleeping? Because it's really fun to track that. And we just continue to look at that as we, as we evaluate you over time to see if that's coming back in. So a lot of times that will do it. No question, people who exercise sleep better than people who do not. Yeah, naps, they're so much fun, but don't do it too much in short bursts. Because if you have trouble sleeping, it's going to take that from you. How nice is this? A hot shower or bath or a sauna before bed. Because it's going to raise your body temperature. And then when you get out of that nice warm environment, it's going to lower it. And as it lowers it, that's going to facilitate sleep in the human body. Have your adrenal function and hormonal balance checked by either a doctor of naturopathy or a functional medicine doctor. We have um, in Massachusetts... Um, Vision Health Associates, which are, there's like three buildings of functional medical doctors. Unfortunately, it's like the 128 belt. The good news is we're about to have, starting next month, a functional nutritionist in the office who will take blood, will take urine, will take saliva, will run the labs on all of this stuff. Because, see, adrenal function is tied into that fight or flight, isn't it? Right? And they get burnt out. And then we don't have that nice ebb and flow with our circadian rhythms anymore. And of course, the hormonal balance. Um, we all have trouble with that, again, due to diet, mm -hmm. the toxins mm -hmm. in the environment. This is interesting. People, that solves the problem for people. Isn't that interesting? You read that over and over again. There's somebody who's put up a pair of socks and it makes a big difference. How easy is that? If you have sleep apnea, you want to be a side sleeper. Raise the head of your bed. Just put the feet up a couple inches. Steam your nasal passages before bed. Throw a little tea tree oil in that steam. Easiest way to steam is you bring a pot of water to the boil. You put it on a trivet on the table in front of you. Towel over, just like the old days. And just breathe that in for a few minutes. And if you add the tea tree oil, it's going to even enhance that experience massively. And then they've got those nasal strips, which honestly, for some people, yeah. Karen's on their head. Reducing environmental noise. Okay, one of the things we have, too many of us have TVs in our bedrooms. That should be banned. No TVs in the bedroom. No sitting in bed and doing your laptop. You have to start to train your brain that when I come in here, I'm going to bed. I'm going to start to wind down. And unfortunately, the laptop engages you in that sympathetic fight or flight half the time. So you don't really want to be doing that, and you don't want to be watching Law and Order. The other thing, too, is you don't want a hot bedroom. 
You really want to cool. 70 would be way too hot for me, but that's what this research says. I only like, like 60 in my bedroom. Window open. So that's, there is actually the science behind that. Increase the melatonin levels naturally by exposure to bright sunlight in the daytime and absolute darkness at night. Um, even light from your clocks, cell phones, computers. Some people have so much technology in their bedrooms, it's like you can almost like read without any lights being on. So you really need to shut that down. We are designed for total darkness. And we're designed to get outside. So all being inside all day long with these artificial lights is definitely affecting all of us. So the people who get outside sleep better. And people who have totally dark bedrooms sleep better. So you really want to start doing that. You can wear a lavender eye mask, block out light, earplugs to block out sound. Because sometimes we don't have total control over our environment. And going to bed by 10 p.m., boy, hasn't that been said for a thousand years? Your best sleep is between 10 and 2. Still true. They're not changing their story. <clears throat> Circadian rhythm, right, matches the physiology with the environment. Darkest sleep. So electric lighting has not been around that long. So basically, for the first how many years we've been on the planet, until a blink ago, we went to bed when it got dark out. It was way too complicated to try to stay awake with a couple of candles. So you went to bed. Right? And you were outside most of your day. Whole different world. I'm sure they had there was zero insomnia back then. And establish a bedtime that's the same. I think most adults are good. This is more of an issue for the young people who tend to stay up till 3 in the morning on weekends. And sleep in and then they try to reset their rhythm. Not good. Aromatherapy or essential oils. Put them on the body. You can have the diffusers in your bedroom. You can spray them on your pillowcase. Which one? Like the lavenders. And they actually make some um, mixtures now of them. And they'll say for sleep. To relax, but usually it's got lavender in it. There are a couple of people who don't like lavender, and so they make some options. I happen to love lavender. How do you quiet the mind's noise? Well, you definitely want to switch gears. So rest is the bridge to sleep. As you get older, it gets harder and harder and harder to go to, from 60 to zero. You have to have that time. You get home, you eat dinner, you unwind, you relax. You need to create a ritual where you're sort of starting to create that sleepiness, allowing programming your body to do that. You know, when I was 30, I could go at 100 miles an hour and then drop into bed, sleep like a log. Not true anymore. No TV right before bed and never sleep with the TV on. It's too stimulating to the brain. You're, you know, you're, those lights are flashing over your eyes and it shuts down that melatonin production. Read something, you know, something spiritual, something religious, something that will help you relax. Like, don't read, right, the mysteries, the crime, the suspense novels, or, you know, don't watch Law and Order. Watch the Hallmark Channel. They're doing all the Christmas movies again. <laughs> I've already seen a hundred times. This is really helpful. Um, one of the things Harry taught me was not only to journal before I went to bed, but if I woke up, with that hypervigilant brain, I would write everything down that my brain was saying. And even when it's messy, because you don't want to turn on a light. Just write it messy. It'll be there for you, but it, it kind of tells your brain, okay, that's done. You don't have to worry about her remembering that. Yeah, I, I've always kept a pen and paper next to my bed ever since the first time Harry did this. And listen to relaxation or hypnotherapy CDs. I did some great work with Harry, and when you do that, he makes you your very own personalized hypnotherapy CD. And try to stay awake during the whole thing. Good luck to you. It's great. There are some supplements. There's no question. We already talked about the purification program. Standard Process makes a lightweight um, tranquilizer called Mintran. This is awesome for kids. This is like all vegetables, mineral-based vegetables. Totally safe. Nothing's in there. Works unbelievable. Orchex is their higher end. Um, great for adults. This is what I do. I take um, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and then I take one before bed. And that's their like anti-anxiety, 
create the parasympathetic state in the body. That's it, but you're not, you don't, it doesn't give you brain fog in any way. Bach Flowers makes a product called White Chestnut. I think Nancy, was it you that turned me on to that? <laughs> yeah. White Chestnut is in particular designed for the racing mind. And that's a couple of drops that you take. They also make a rescue remedy. And that's what I find works really good for me. Yeah, and I'm going to talk about my little. And of course, there's, this is great. I'm always so glad when I take the time to make myself a cup of this tea. You know, you got to do it ahead of time so, you know, you're not waking up to pee. But I really <laughs> think it should be part of that, it should be the early part of that two hour before bed ritual. You start with this, you know, and so that you're really setting the stage. So this is, this is what's really helped me, was my sessions with Harry Croner and the CD that I listen to at night. I take that Orchex, like I told you. I spray my tongue three times with that Bach Flower Rescue before I go to bed. And then they have this now. It's homeopathic. And I dissolve one of these when I go to bed. And then if you wake up, you can dissolve another one. And I really do find I go right back to sleep. So you can get these at um, Simple Enough, at um, Bosch's. Simple Enough in Westboro. Bosch's is in Hudson. But that's what I found trying all this stuff, all the melatonins, all the GABA. I've done everything. Tried it all. This is the best routine I've ever had in terms of um, really trying to get me into a much more, into a state that I can sleep deeper. Because again, Lights like this, I mean, I'm, it's, had, it's a 14 hour day. When I gotta try to go to sleep after that, it's hard. So now, we're gonna talk about, I love hypnotherapy. Who's had hypnotherapy before? Oh, it's the best, it's the best. So this is why I do this workshop, so I get to be hypnotized by Harry again. So I'm gonna um, hand the reins over to Harry, who's going to help us sleep even better. Yay. Thank you, thank you. All right, so um, I want to talk a little bit about um, the mental and emotional aspects of, of, uh, of our challenges of going to sleep. And as, as uh, Dr. Karen mentioned, a lot of us has the challenges of uh, falling asleep, and, and, and what's very, very common too is um, staying asleep. When you wake up in those kind of middle of the night kind of, kind of hours and times which are uh, challenging, and it's hard to go back to sleep, always thinking about those things to do at work, things that you want to achieve, Finances, as we saw, is a big problem. Finances, things that bother you, challenges with family members, whether it's, it's kind of elderly grandparents or your, your children or your grandchildren. If someone has a problem, your, your spouse. It's always someone, something to worry about, it feels like it, right? So it's important to um, allow that, that constant barrage of things to, to, uh, to start handling them. In, in a better way. So I want to talk to you about it and I'm going to go through different things here and I'm going to combine it all together at the end with a meditation, okay? So we'll, we'll do a, a quick presentation and we'll go to do a med meditation, okay? So I want to talk a little bit more about what happens when we sleep. So we talk, I'm going to talk about the subconscious and what happens when, um, when we deal with, with that level of things because so this is when everything comes up. So <clears throat> our sleep is not a one block, right? You, you're aware of that. So when coming down from being awake, you go into a very deep sleep very quickly. Within 45 minutes, you're in delta brain waves here, and you're going very, very deeply. <clears throat> and then you start going through the natural rhythm of cycling. And this length of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a movement, it changes slightly between a person to the next, but it's about an hour and a half every, every segment of those. That's why <clears throat> you have those times when you wake up, an, an average time to wake up is like three in the morning. It's a magical time in, in the middle of the night. And it's because you, you, you are about in that third uh, portion here, and you bring yourself very, very closely to, to wakeful. This is a wakeful state. You come very closely to wakeful state. So this is why it's so easy to just wake up. And, you, and a lot of us, especially men here over 40, believe me, I've done this, which is terrible. You have to wake up in the middle of the night and just go. Uh, so you do that, you, and you have to come back to sleep. But <clears throat> it's, uh, it's important to know that um, we have the power to not fall into like, oh, and I have this to do in the morning, and I have this, and, and, and really allow yourself, okay, now I just allow myself to, I, I like this new, I, I came up with it lately, slip back into sleep. 
I can just slip back into sleep because it really is just that that kind of decision to just kind of let go. It's like kind of do that switch between like I'm holding on to things and thoughts and all those back burners of things that I have to do and places to be, uh, and focusing right here. I just like kind of let go of all that and let myself kind of slip into that comfortable letting go. And we'll do that in just a moment. So <clears throat> another important thing about this, the cycles of sleep. Um, and, and Dr. Karen mentioned that it's about uh, naps. I, I'm a big fan of, of power naps. Uh, make them 10, 15 minutes long, and it's it's ideal. You, you wouldn't think it. Like even if you go you go to sleep, or you don't fully go to sleep at 15 minutes, um, you'll still wake up feeling absolutely refreshed. And if you sleep, it's wonderful because you still are down, up up here. You still didn't go very deeply, and and uh, and allow yourself to wake up, and you feel very good. If you allow yourself 45 minutes, if you have slept like 45 minutes and beyond, you down here and wake up from this, you feel groggy and out of it, and you're like you can't really wake up for the rest of the day. So that's why it happens, because, because you're messing up with your sleep cycles. So do those 10 minute naps, 10, 15 minutes naps, and it's golden, it's beautiful. So it's, uh, it's a good thing to have. And it will definitely support you, and, and again, it's not gonna disrupt the, um, your overnight sleep, because it's not enough to change that, but it's enough to, to allow you to completely let go, disengage, allow the body to rest, re recuperate, and feeling refreshed. So let's talk about uh, uh, changing your sleeping habits 